The 2019 Idaho legislative session began January 7th with new Governor Brad Little's first State of the State address. Going into the session, the big issues were expected to be Medicaid expansion and funding for our public schools, and they have been. But lawmakers are tackling other big issues too, including water rights, the mental health of our first responders, plus measures about hemp and daylight saving time. Today, Speaker of the House, Republican Scott Bedke, and House Minority Leader, Democrat Matt Erpelding, give a legislative session progress report. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. The first regular session of the 65th Idaho Legislature is now eight weeks in. Legislative sessions usually last into late March or early April. As lawmakers hit the home stretch, we thought it was a good time to check in with legislative leaders on both sides of the aisle for a progress report. I'd like to welcome my guests, Speaker of the House Scott Bedke, a Republican from Oakley, and House Minority Leader Matt Erpelding, a Democrat from Boise. Gentlemen, as always, thank you for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's good to be here, Doug. Um, first of all, let's start off with the big issue that everybody was talking about heading into the session and now throughout the session, that is uh, Medicaid expansion. Jay Fack, the Budget Setting Committee, <clears throat> voted unanimously this week to fund the state's portion for Medicaid expansion with money from the Millennium Fund, as you gentlemen know, uh, the tobacco settlement money. Do you expect expansion now to, to go through, the, to, to make it through the full legislature? Well, uh, that's, that's a great question, and I believe that it ultimately will do that. Uh, keep in mind that uh, maybe to the outside, the JFAX action is a, is a very positive signal that, that it will move, but that was just their introducing a bill uh, as per their schedule so that they are not, uh, if, if we end up going into to April, mm -hmm. that it wasn't their fault. And so this will, there's other things that have got to happen mm -hmm. uh, for that bill to move, but uh, that, that's, that's a start. And keep in mind, there's only six months of the of the full Medicaid expansion in this year's or this coming year's budget, uh, because it it doesn't, uh, you know, our fiscal year doesn't coincide with the there's the, six uh, months apart, with the right, calendar yeah. year, and so, so they uh, they have done that as if. Uh, uh, you know, preparatory to the other action, but there still has been no other bills move yet. But I, I think that will change this coming week. And do you think that, I know that the, the governor has said that he doesn't support really any sideboards such as work requirements and whatnot on this. Um, Representative Verpelding, do you anticipate that happening or do, do you want it to go through as the voters passed it? Well, I'd prefer that it would go through as the voters passed it and um, ongoing polling of the voters, the voters prefer that they uh, have it as they passed it. But to get it out of the House, I think that we're grappling with a segment of House membership that is advocating for barriers to entry, which would be work requirements and other aspects that continue to, to pop up and continue to be a uh, obstacle to getting it through. Now, whether what it will look like when it's all said and done, my hope is that there are no barriers to entry into the Medicaid program for health care, but um, I think we still have a long road to go. And Speaker, what would be the next step? In well, the, the next step is to introduce uh, uh, these sideboards, I guess, because, I mean, this is, as the, the people passed it, there was no funding with it. And so this, the legislature has got to fund that. Mm -hmm. You saw the very start of that process with right. JFAC's action. Now, there, is there are additional funding measures that will have to pass. Uh, and, and, and because there are things that, uh, you know, the money has to be there, then there will be requirements. It's, uh, these work requirements that, that you bring up are not as onerous as everyone would like to think. These would be the same work requirements that are, uh, that are mandatory if you're going to qualify for food stamps. And, uh, you know, and we already are set up, many of these, this same population is uh, a food stamp recipient. They are the working poor, so if they are working, then they have a job and thus would qualify. Right. So I don't know that these are, are as onerous as uh, some would like to uh, portray them. Uh, but there are, there, there's reluctance uh, in some, well, in the, in the House of Representatives on just doing a uh, open, no restrictions. I mean, I, I think everyone would, you know, some of the sideboards are going to look like a drug screening, not in a way to, to, to eliminate people from the program, but to direct them to uh, a, a treatment program. 
there are if the rate if the state if the state's share changes in this in this new uh, program that from 90 10 then that would be grounds for uh, going off the program we also a another Another thing is we've got to we've got to broaden the, the on the mental health side. We've got to uh, pursue a waiver with the federal government to include mental health hospitals as qualified Medicaid providers so that they can be uh, uh, compensated. And a couple of these are essentially what you would do anyway if you're a responsible practitioner. So the the health screening that the speaker talks about is not a barrier to entry. Um, but when we talk about work requirements as an expectation and relating it to SNAP, that's all well and good, but now you create a bureaucratic blanket that you throw over the top of this that's gonna cost, what, four, maybe five million at a minimum. And so there's a concern with that. Um, it may not provide benefit, but it's gonna cost money. So we'll see how this develops then over the course uh, of the This is a 400 and Forty million yeah. dollar program. I think when we spend that kind of money, then then it uh, deserves this type of scrutiny, and and uh, that those are coming from, uh, you know, the taxpayers. And I think that the taxpayers are owed some type of performance back from the people that are receiving the the entitlement. Government. The governor recently said uh, he basically said the legislature must fund this before the session ends. Do you expect if it doesn't happen? Uh, through vote that he'll call a special session? Well, he has his ways of keeping us there until we do it okay. uh, anyway. So uh, we would rather avoid that, frankly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, We and, all want to go home. <laughs> and, but the, and the governor has also, has also said that we'll do this in a, quote, Idaho way. And uh, that is yet to be defined. Okay. We'll keep an eye on that subject for, for sure. I want to touch on uh, education briefly right now. Um, JFAC also yes. approved a budget for education, 6% increase. I think it was roughly around $110 million more mm -hmm. uh, for public education, K through 12 schools in Idaho, $2.2 billion budget. Uh, Representative Verpelding, first of all, are you happy with where that budget that JFAC approved stands and, and its priorities? Yeah, absolutely. I think that what JFAC did, plus a bill that we passed out of the House earlier this week, which would uh, raise starting teachers' wages to $40,000, which is what g actually former Governor Otter's task force recommended in the first place. So I think getting us where we need to be, where the professionals have said our teachers need to be, is a step in the, in the right direction. And how about for you, Mr. Well, I Speaker? I think all Idahoans should be proud of their, of their education system, and, and this is this is the fifth year of a five-year commitment that we made uh, you know, previously to follow through with the career ladder, to fund it as has been described here. And uh, it also, the budget also includes uh, additional money for literacy, in, you know, K, through K through three literacy. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, you know, it keeps us on the same good trajectory that we've been on. And so nothing changes. It was very non-controversial. Uh, right. There was no dissenting votes in the uh, in the uh, in the Jin JFAC. Uh, we doubt there will be very many on on the House floor or the Senate floor. Um, I want to talk now about a couple bills that were very important to, to each of you, um, Mr. Speaker. First of all, uh, I'll start with your bill about water rights. It was uh, House Bill One, first bill approved this session. The first bill signed by uh, Governor Little into law. You know, as the snow piles up in the mountains, people start thinking about now the runoff, right. the filling up of the reservoirs, and of course possible flooding. Can you talk about what the law, uh, your water rights law, does in terms of that um, to protect <coughs> the water rights of users? Well, can, yeah, I can, and I'll try to do it briefly. If you can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, this year is setting up to be a year where we will test this, uh, this whole premise. It was always about the, the Boise River system and its dual nature of, of not only uh, being there for flood control, but also being there for uh, irrigation and uh, providing minimum stream flows in the Boise River, uh, you know, fish habitat, etc. Sure. And all of that comes from the, a, a storage right that is up in the in the reservoirs but if you have the old storage rights if you were a farmer or or, uh, or those that depend on irrigation then you were always concerned when they let water out on a flood year because that was your water mm -hmm. and it accounted against so they said farmers you're all set 
on paper your right is full. So even if the water goes past their irrigation yeah, system yeah, so already, they, that's So they let the water that. out in hopes that they shut the gates in time to fill it back up and that becomes uh, a question mark. And so the, the, the senior space holders said, and rightly so, that we're okay with that, but this flood, these flood releases shouldn't cost us water in July or August. And so that's what that did, that uh, uh, House Bill number one was, was, way, was, was simple, but it was an important piece to allow the other negotiation to go forward. And uh, it's passed, it's signed, and uh, we should be able to put that behind us. It's important for the Treasure Valley for this region is that it assures, you know, this is the fastest growing part of the state and the fastest growing state in the union. And water in the West is always going to be scarce. This just aligns, every, everyone knows where their rights stop and the next guy's rights start. And that, uh, and that allows for orderly uh, progress, orderly growth uh, here in the Treasure Valley. It, it, uh, Anyway, water's going to be continue to be a scarce resource, Absolutely. and we've got to take care of it. This is a step in that direction. And uh, Representative Erpelding, just uh, Thursday morning, mm -hmm. your bill um, to provide workers' compensation coverage for first responders who suffer a uh, post-traumatic stress yeah. injury on the job passed a pretty strong vote in the House. Uh, yes. How do you feel now that it's gone through, and, and why you feel that is the bill has been so important? Uh, the bill is critical to first ending the stigma that PTSI is something that people can't talk about. Um, but more importantly, it is a tool to help our first responders actually get access to the treatments that they need to be able to continue to work and continue to do a good job. In addition to the fact that PTSI has a longitudinal effect on people and that when it happens early on and the experiences happen early on, traumas happen early on in their profession, it might not pop up for another 10 years. And in that time, um, without feeling comfortable talking about it and knowing that it's okay to talk about it, people turn to all kinds of different types of self-medicine. So um, alcohol addiction, substance abuse, and ultimately in many cases, our first responders commit suicide and more first responders have committed suicide than have been killed in the line of duty in the last five this years. This is a lot about like what they see and what yes. they witness in terms yes. of, you know, horrible murder scenes or car accidents and things yeah. like that, right? Yeah, and it adds up. I mean, they see things that you and I would only see in our nightmares or we would see one time in our life. They see it on a regular basis, multiple times a day, if not multiple times, um, you know, in a, in a shift. And so what this does is it just really clarifies that PTSI is an injury, just like a back injury, an ankle injury, a broken finger, whatever. Um, and we wanna make sure that we get the services to the people who need it the most and our first responders are leading the way on that. Okay. Thank you very much for the answers on these questions. Um, we're going to pause the conversation right here. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back. Stay tuned. Our conversation with the Speaker of the House and the House Minority Leader will continue after the break. Stay tuned. It's the wall-to-wall -wall sale at Furniture Row, and that means huge savings on every sofa, dining table, and bed. Find sofas in classic styles to power reclining comfort, dining tables with rustic charm, to simple distressed finishes, streamlined modern beds to timeless classics and save big on our entire lineup of doctor's choice mattresses plus four years no interest shop today and save during the wall-to-wall -wall sale at furniture row <laughs> Moments when I love my job. World of Dance moves to its new night tonight, 8, 7 central on NBC. I did something. So cute. Count. How high? I don't know, a million. That's impossible. List all the Phil Collins songs. Uh, Sue Sue Studio. Good Girls Season 2 premieres tonight after World of Dance on NBC. It's Ellen's birthday. I thought it would be nice if everyone in the audience brought a gift for you. A lot of them are very light. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel, Miley Cyrus, Mark Ronson, and Tom Hanks from Smithville, Missouri. <laughs> Plus, a huge surprise for Ellen and the audience, too. Oprah used to do this a lot before she abandoned us. <laughs> it's Ellen's big birthday show. Weekdays at 2 on Idaho's News Channel 7. You could have had so much, but instead you had me. You will always be my good thing. 
How about we take care of each other? I don't have it in me. You are stronger than you know. I'm in your bones, and you are everywhere in me. You live here, your family. So I keep hearing. The Village premieres March 19th on NBC. And welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Today we're getting a legislative progress report from Idaho House leadership. My guests are Speaker of the House Scott Bedke and House Minority Leader Matt Erpelding. A bill introduced in the House Agriculture Committee would legalize production of industrial hemp in Idaho, basically um, changing Idaho law to sync up with the 2018 federal farm bill. Where do you feel that the legislature stands on this issue at this time or, or yourself, Mr. Speaker? Well, I mean, the, we will we'll conform with the, with the National Farm Bill, which, which allows for the industrial uh, growth of, of the hemp plant. Now in Idaho, we have, we have had a hard line and said that any plant that has any THC in it is, uh, is prohibited. Yet hemp has uh, a, not enough to, you know, for any hallucinogenic properties, but it has some in it. So we'll have to conform uh, our laws to allow for, uh, not for the growth of it, but also for the transport of hemp across our, our, our state. I, I agree with, with Governor Little uh, that, and, the, and the position that he took right at the first of the session when he said, you know, we're okay with growing hemp, for industrial purposes, but if it becomes camouflage for marijuana, then he has a problem with that. And threading that needle, uh, where we've had zero tolerance uh, up to this point for anything that had THC, is is going to affect some a bunch of changes in our laws. But uh, I mean, it's uh, you know it's a it's a useful crop, and uh, we will will go that way. But we also are going to be very deferential to our law enforcement community. Uh, that, that doesn't want to make their, they don't want us to make their job any harder than it already sure. is. And Representative Verbal, <coughs> does this, this case where we have right now where this truck driver had a truckload of right. what they would say was hemp, he was arrested for it, does that kind of put a little more urgency on this well, issue? Well, it certainly in doesn't, that, is, and, and I sit on agriculture, so I've been sitting through the hearings for these, this hemp issue. And as, as you know, we can buy hemp hearts, we can buy hemp lotion, we can buy all kinds of hemp products in our supermarkets, but we can't grow it in large part because it's simply misclassified, and it's been misclassified since the 1920s. This truckload of hemp that was being transported um, part of uh, the concern was that they didn't have a way to identify it on the, like, on the fly. And part of the presentation in agriculture is there is actually technology on hand where you can identify how much THC is in a mm -hmm. product to differentiate between cannabis, marijuana, and hemp. And I think that will help CHP and it'll keep it from making their job harder because I agree with the speaker that legalizing hemp for farmers to be able to grow right now is being pitched as this is gonna be the panacea. But as soon as every state <coughs> is growing hemp, that's not gonna be a panacea. But there are gonna be farmers that use it. There are gonna be, uh, there, is a, there is an economy for it in Idaho. So let's figure out how to do it without putting undue burden on CHP. I believe you both voted against the law that would, uh, or the bill, excuse me, that would have exempted Idaho from daylight saving time. Um, Mr. Speaker, what did, uh, what was your reasoning for voting against that one? Well, personally, it's never been a big problem for me. I, I, I adjust easily uh, when we switch it back, and there was certainly no hue or cry from my legislative district that we, that we stay on standard time. Uh, there maybe would have been a push to to go to daylight savings and stay on daylight savings, but that's a but that is a a decision that is not made at the state level. That's made at the federal level, and so I I uh, I wasn't a fan. I don't see I don't think there's a big problem there personally, uh, and uh, the disruption was not worth it. So. And, and uh, how about for you, Representative Ripley? Well, District 19. You, you made about the best argument against yeah. it, that, yeah. you know. Uh, as, as being an outfitter, I, yeah, I believe, is your uh, argument, uh, and having that extra hour in the evening. Right? Yeah, and I, I think that there was a perception I was making the argument on my behalf, but I received so many emails well, from my district. There are a lot of people who have similar yeah, professions. Yeah, so many people from my district, though, that work nine to five jobs, and that extra hour at night is when they recreate. 
And mm -hmm. so from an outfitter and guiding perspective, particularly day guiding, it's a problem. But then for people who just want to get out after work, it was a real concern. Um, and to the speaker's point, if you wanted to stay on daylight savings, we basically need the entire region to come together and have a conversation and get Washington, Oregon, everybody to say, okay, this is what we're gonna do, and then we would need federal approval. But to go to standard daylight time would make Spokane four o'clock, Idaho three o'clock, and Montana five o'clock, and it's yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. I wanna <clears throat> touch on a couple issues briefly. Um, a bipartisan bill to reform Idaho's mandatory minimum sentencing laws for drug offenses. Uh, sponsored by representatives Ilana Rubel and Brian Zollinger, was sent to the House floor for a vote, um, arguing that basically judges' hands are tied right now with minimum sentences for drug offenders. Do you think it needs to be reformed, Mr. Speaker, to give the judges more <clears throat> leeway? I, I am not, I will err on the side of uh, public safety. Now, I believe that the numbers inside of the min mandatory minimums need to be relaxed. Uh, and uh, but the sentencing, uh, I don't know so much. Of, I'm, I'm not. I'm not there yet, okay. frankly. But uh, the 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 violation or the uh, the numbers or the amount that you would have to trigger that uh, are they too low? Arguably, they are. And uh, so I would be more about uh, relaxing the numbers inside the, of a of the of the law that triggers a mandatory sentence rather than just addressing it by relaxing mandatory sentence. So that's, that's kind of where I would be. How about you, sir? Uh, I'm with the speaker in that the, the, the current trigger for it is way too low, particularly when you're talking about opioids. But at the same time, uh, I think that there is an important piece of our judicial system that gives judicial discretion to the judges to decide where this person is in relation to the context of their whole life. If it's somebody who's seasoned, clearly has issues, needs to go to prison for a longer period of time, I think that there should be some flexibility for the judges. And um, I think that law and order is, uh, the judicial system is a piece of law and order. The judges would prefer a little bit more flexibility, um, and so that's where I land. So I think that what Representative <coughs> Rubel and Representative Zollinger are proposing um, doesn't change the minimums, but what it does is it just it, it changes the the amount of discretion that a judge has to make a de decision based on the entire factor of this particular uh, offender. We have just one minute left, Mr. Speaker. Do you anticipate at this point, eight weeks in, that there will be any other? major issues that come in, in the form of new bills or is a lot of the focus going to be on budgets and Medicaid? Well, we always, I don't know what they are at this point, but there will be something that, that somebody thinks of or we go, oh, uh, we forgot Got this or we, we need to address that or Congress acts. Uh, I, I saw a bill introduced in, in Congress that, uh, that changes the 90-10 back on the Medicaid issue back to 100 and then goes to 90-10. I don't know if that goes anywhere. If it does, that may uh, require some, uh, some adjustment in our language. Uh, but there's always something. And the, the good news is, is we'll be here next January and most of the stuff <laughs> could wait. How about for you? I think there's one thing that hasn't been introduced yet that we probably need to have a look at, and that's the <coughs> Wayfair decision. So that's talking about how Idaho starts to collect internet sales tax after mm -hmm. the Supreme Court ruled this summer. I know that it's somewhere in the works. I know that there's some tinkering with it right now, but that actually is kind of a big issue, particularly to protect our brick and mortar uh, shops. Shops and stores have created a level playing field. Um, and then, of course, there's probably going to be things that surprise me, and uh, we'll cross that bridge when we have to. Hopefully we can have you gentlemen on again if you'd be willing to come to give us a wrap up of the session. Yeah, but we don't want to spoil any of the surprises. No, yeah. <laughs> this is all just a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned to the legislature for that cliffhanger next week. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Verbal Ding and Speaker Bedke. I appreciate You're always your welcome. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Well, the 2020 presidential election may be a year and a half away, but the campaign has already come to Idaho. Julian Castro was the first Democratic candidate to stump in Boise. You'll hear from the former San Antonio mayor and HUD secretary next on Viewpoint. <sighs> you can probably guess how this is going to go. Uncomfortably close close-ups, ingredients defying gravity. Melting this, splashing that. Charbroil Double Deals from Carl's Jr. Oh, sh**! Two forty-nine each? It's the wall-to-wall -wall sale at Furniture Row, and that means huge savings on every sofa, dining table, and bed. Find sofas in classic styles to power reclining comfort. 
dining tables with rustic charm, to simple distressed finishes, streamlined modern beds, to timeless classics, and save big on our entire lineup of Doctor's Choice mattresses, plus four years no interest. Shop today and save during the wall-to-wall -wall sale at Furniture Row. You are invited to the 68th annual Quaker Village Auction at Greenleaf Friends Academy. The event kicks off Friday, March 8th at 5.30 p.m. with food, entertainment, and a live auction. Doors open Saturday at 7 in the morning with a pancake breakfast followed by a live auction featuring handmade quilts, a storage shed, and lots of unique items. And there's a carnival for kids. We'll see you at the Quaker Village Auction. To post your local event, visit the Idaho Events Calendar at KTVB.com. Monday, the coaches fall hard for the talent. Hello, handsome. But don't miss what? The artist. Oh my God! Who has everyone stunned? You're a better singer than all of us. <laughs> then America is hooked on the enemy within. You're a traitor and you're a killer. I made a choice to save my daughter. I said I trust anything you have to say. You cannot save this country without me. The enemy within. After the voice. Monday on NBC. Yeah, I've seen a lot out here in the West. But a juicy charbroiled burger with a patty made from plants? Only the folks at Carl's Jr. can pull out something that bold. The new Beyond Famous Star with Cheese. Only at Carl's Jr. Hundreds of people turned out at Boise State Tuesday night to hear from 2020 Democratic presidential hopeful Julian Castro. The former mayor of San Antonio and housing secretary in the Obama administration addressed a standing room only crowd. He told the audience he met with state Democratic leaders and was impressed that Idaho had done something his home state of Texas hasn't done, past Medicaid expansion. He also said he was able to visit with young Idaho Democrats on campus to listen to their concerns about the future. Folks here in Idaho have a lot of the same concerns that the people in my home state of Texas or anywhere else you go, I'm going to be focused on how we can make the United States the smartest, the healthiest, the fairest, and the most prosperous nation on earth. At the age of 44, pundits consider Castro a long shot in a crowded field that includes Bernie Sanders and potentially former Vice President Joe Biden. But he says he is undaunted and is looking forward to the race. Castro has promised to visit all 50 states during his campaign. The last Democratic presidential candidate to visit Idaho was Bernie Sanders back in 2016. That's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news and right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.